yourself a cold one. They strike them, huh? And listen to Ross Tucker break down the top college prospects on another tasty edition of The College Draft. Daddy Soda Time here on the College Draft Podcast, presented, of course, as always, by DraftKings. I'm Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years. Now I call games for the Eagles in the preseason, CBS on TV, both college and NFL, and then Westwood One, call a bunch of NFL games, and the Army-Navy game on the radio, which I really enjoy. Bunch of podcasts. I know you guys are enjoying Ross Tucker Football Podcast three days a week. Here in the offseason, the Even Money podcast gets posted on Tuesday. A lot to talk about tomorrow with Steve Fezzik about March Madness. If you get involved in March Madness and celebrate tournament at all, you got to listen to the Even Money podcast this week because Steve Fezzik will give you all the tips to help win your pool, your tournament, your whatever you're doing with your buddies or your colleagues. It's probably more important to beat your colleagues than your buddies even. And then... Of course, the Fantasy Feast with Joe Dolan has just been on a roll as of late. Five episodes, believe it or not, after this one until the 2024 NFL Draft. We'll do tight ends, fullbacks next week. Then we'll do O-line. Then we'll do D-line. Then we'll do linebackers. Then we'll do DBs. We got to hustle today because we got receivers. And Emory even mentioned last week when we were talking running backs it's kind of the year of the receiver. I mean, there are a bunch of good ones. By Emory, of course, I'm talking about the star of this show, at F-Ball Game Plan on Twitter, Football Game Plan on YouTube, calls games for a bunch of different outlets. He's all over CBS Sports HQ. He's like one of their big stars. You can buy the draft guide now. You need to buy the draft guide now. Footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. Okay, if you're new, you might not realize that Emery splits his receivers up to different groups, right? So he's got split ends, flankers, slot receivers, and inside receivers. Um, Slot receivers are typically Emery. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a chance. We do this every year, but you know what? We get new listeners every year, new people watch us on YouTube youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. So the quick version of the, the breakdown of the four different receiver positions. Your split ends are your X receivers. That's your bona fide number one guys, your AJ Greens, your, uh, you know, Devon, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, those type guys, guys you could trust one-on-one that essentially are very good versus press coverage. Your flankers are your more athletic of the three of the four and yes, they all can be athletic, but these are guys that can really go that that are do that do well off the line of scrimmage, but that can do a lot of damage uh, deeper down the field. They, these are your home run type guys. Um, Jerry Rice was a flanker, by the way. Uh, also, when you look at your slot receivers, that's self explanatory. These are more of your shifty guys. They could be big guys, they could be small guys, but these are guys that could do well uh, in short areas of the field, but also can block on the inside. The speed of inside, the inside receivers are kind of the cousins of the split ends, guys that are able to beat press, but maybe not as explosive as guys on the outside. But if you just kick them down, you know, four by four, right there on the hash, right there on the numbers, they can do a lot of damage for you inside. So they kind of the cousins of both the split end and also the slot receivers because they can work well underneath, but they also could bang inside and make the big plays over the middle of the field. Love it. Let's start with the split ends. These are the X receiver, a lot of times single receiver side. Got to win one-on-one, got to win against press. Your number one ranked split end is Rome Adunze from Washington. Very good wide out, man. Consistent in terms of his release, consistent in terms of his hand usage, able to stack and track, which means he'll beat the guy off the line get in front of him, make it hard for him to stay in the play and continue to accelerate toward the ball to create that, uh, extend that separation. So he is one of the more consistent, consistently good receivers at those aspects of receiver play in the draft class, which is why he landed number one. What about Jermaine Burton from Bama? I think not a lot of people are talking about him, Ross, because he is super explosive. Um, He was open a lot 
when you watch Alabama, he's open a lot. Uh, granted, their offensive line wasn't the best, uh, so it requires protection and a quarterback to, to have time to get him the football. But, man, he was open a ton for Alabama. He does a lot of those things well. Probably one of the more explosive and short area bursts in the in the X receiver group uh, that we have in this draft class. There's a bunch of schools, Washington, Texas, LSU, that have multiple good receivers. Texas has a couple. You've got one listed as a split end. The other one will be coming up later as well. What about Adonai Mitchell from Texas? He reminds me so much, Ross, of C.D. Lamb. He is someone that could win at all three levels. We've seen him win in a jump ball scenario. We've seen him win in a catch and run scenario. He looks to score the ball, which is where that C.D. Lamb comp came from. And he went, he could win short. And he also, I don't know if you know this, Ross, he's a fantastic athlete, as a lot of these guys are. So they can fly as a lot of these receivers can do this year. So this is why it's a great year for receivers. Because I feel like Mitchell can play all three levels, play them well, and be a fantastic receiver, whether it's a number one or as a number two. He can play any one of the three positions, in my opinion. What about Brian Thomas from LSU? A lot of people really like him. Big body guy that can go vertical. Another one of these underrated catch and run guys. And for him, for, for being a 6'3", 210-pound wideout that can catch and run, that's a scary proposition. Uh, we know he can take off. We know he plays above the rim. He's explosive as well. That's the common theme here. And, yeah, while Neighbors was getting a lot of the buzz, Thomas was having equally as impressive of a year, and which is why he's uh, definitely, again, we're talking about top five, but all of these guys' grades are very high in my opinion. What about Xavier Leggett from South Carolina? Man, explosive, physical, and upside. Like, he has all the three, and he's checking the holy trinity in terms of wide receiver play on the outside. When you think about um, South Carolina, it, it feels like if we go all the way back to Sterling Sharp, there's a type. You have Sterling Sharp, physical, built well. Zola Davis, remember him? Physical, built well. Jermaine Kelly, physical, built well. And we know about Debo Samuel, all these other guys, Elshon Jeffrey. They just have a type down there at South Carolina. They look the part, they play the part, and Leggett is the next in line of some great game cock wide receivers. All right, let's go to the flankers. You talked about the flankers as being speed guys, a little bit more athletic. Your number one ranked flanker, a guy that several teams reportedly have as the number one receiver on the board, which means they might have him as the number one overall player, Malik Neighbors from LSU. No one talks about this, Ross, but you know how explosive you have to be to catch a, a hitch over the middle of the field from a dead stop, turn around, and go 70? That's insane level of acceleration, explosiveness. And here's the thing, and I wish we – I don't know if I said this on a show. We have to check the archives. But I knew Malik Neighbors was going to be a better receiver than Kayshawn Bouti based off a, a small three-yard gain – against, I want to say, UAB in the rain. On the sideline, this man made one of the a catch, Ross, that just looked like it was a routine, like throw it out to the flat. It was an, an insane catch that looked that would make Brandon Lloyd blush. That's how fantastic his hands are. So, yeah, he may not be 6'5", but he could win above the rim. He could make the impossible catch. And, oh, by the way, explosive game-breaking speed. A lot of people have him ranked ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr., as do you, uh, Emery. What, what is it about Malik Neighbors that, that you like maybe more than Harrison Jr.? Explosiveness and route running. Two things that I feel like he does better than Harrison, and also he gets off press coverage better than Harrison. So those three things is why I have Harrison below Neighbors and below a lot of these receivers that we talked about in the previous uh, group, the X receivers. So let's get to your second-ranked flanker. This is a guy that we should probably bring up the combine again. I know it was a couple weeks ago now, but we're talking about Keon Coleman from Florida State. Did not run a great 40 time, but then like, he was like running the drills. And I'm like, wait a minute. He's like the third fastest guy running the drills with the GPS when he's actually out there catching footballs and running around on the field as opposed to getting out of a track stance. 
He was running those drills faster than guys that ran a 4-4, and he's a 4-6. You know what that tells me? He's a big dude that probably has a terrible start. You know, and guess what? I haven't seen a, a, a wide receiver line up in a three-point stance or in a track stance since like the early 80s. So they don't really do that anymore anyway. I think Michael Irvin was the last one to line up in a three-point stand at the University of Miami, right? <laughs> With that big 47 jersey on. Um, but you're right. And it also shows you, Ross, it shows me, he has confident hands. I could fly through this goal that jerks and I'm going to catch the ball. When you're unsure, you're kind of slowing down, making sure you catch it. But when you're confident, you can just run straight through. And he didn't waver. He ran in a straight line at 20-plus miles an hour. So he has great hands. He, to me, has the arrogant hands uh, of a George Pickens in this class, the type of guy that I want out there on my team. Now, you can't have too many of them because it could be anarchy, and you can't have too many of them on the, on the same side of the ball. We saw that play out with the Ravens on defense uh, when Marcus Peters and company was there, but I love the attitude of a Keon Coleman. He is an outstanding talent and should be someone's number one right away. Wow. Really? Right away? Yeah. Yeah, listen, uh, you want someone – that can win at the catch point, win in the red zone, um, and show you that he can uh, go up top and snatch the ball away, he is the quarterback's best friend with his wide catch radius. All right, let's get to your third-ranked flanker, Marvin Harrison Jr. This is probably going to get some people's attention, Emery. They're going to be surprised that Marvin Harrison Jr. isn't ranked this high on your board and your rankings as he is elsewhere, what what are your concerns with Harrison Jr.? Well, firstly, this is what we talked about last episode with folks being married to takes preseason way too early mock drafts. We kind of get stuck saying the same thing like Marvin Harrison Jr., Marvin Harrison Jr. But then you go back and watch the tape and you're like, okay, you know, he, he really doesn't have the consistency in getting off bump press. Um, he's not as explosive. Or, you know, straight line fast, which is probably why he didn't run the 40. I'm not saying that speed is everything, but, I mean, when you are running a 4 or 5, which is very fast, compared to everyone else running 4, 2, 4, 3, it's not going to look right. You know what I'm saying? Especially if everyone already perceives you to be the number one target, why give them anything to try to knock you down? And when you watch a lot of his big plays outside of him going up top and winning above the rim, and catching the ball at his highest point, he has he has elite hands, so don't get me wrong about that. He has great hands. But a lot of his big plays are schemed open, right? So that tells me he's probably best off the line of scrimmage because he's not as nuanced of a route runner, and he's not as explosive or twitchy, and he has to get better and more consistent in getting all bump press. Those are the things that concern me about Marvin Harrison Jr. But, man, when you talk about someone that's an alpha out there in terms of catching a football, confident in his, in his hands, I graded him at, as a high school player uh, doing those uh, football game plan 400 PA high school players of the week. And you saw his tape at high school. And he was doing the same things like just a confident kid and grew into his frame. So he's developed and he still has room to grow. So I'm I'm excited to see him transition from what I feel like is a, you know, one B or two to a bona fide number one as a pro. Listen, whether you're hosting game day or movie night, the Giorno knows that planning a watch party on a budget isn't easy. You need the perfect setting, perfect squad, and the perfect eats. Luckily, you're a game time mastermind, and you know that grabbing DiGiorno classic crust pizza can bring home a dub because it's packed with half a pound of cheese, sauce, other toppings, and comes at an incredible price. Make the game-winning call and grab a DiGiorno classic crust pizza from the grocery store today. It's not delivery. It's DiGiorno. Love me some pizza. Love me some beer with the pizza. If you really want to take things to the next level, drink some Labatt Blue Lights with your friends. Live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer. Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Your thoughts at Flanker, Troy Franklin, Troy Franklin Emery. Yeah, listen, I'm not saying he's... He, this was a fun evaluation because watching him, you see someone that's long, lean, that can fly, man. And another one that was open a lot in college on tape. So that kind of brings in the quarterback play. But in terms of his route running, I think his, his route running is where you want it to be. Um, I think he has a frame to at least 
add a couple more pounds without losing the explosiveness and the speed. He catches the ball well over his shoulder. Um, kind of like a taller version of how Ted Ginn was. Uh, you know, maybe a DJ Chark, someone like that. Uh, but I like his ability, man. I just think that you get him on, I would hate to see him hate meaning love in Miami, where you have these short, explosive guys, and then you throw a taller one in there to run just straight vertical routes over the middle of the field. Is Who are you going to cover? So Franklin is someone that's going to be a, a team's go ball guy, a big play guy, and I see it happening for sure. What about Mr. 42140 Xavier Worthy? What does the tape actually show of Xavier Worthy? Now, he's a really good receiver, man. He can play. Um, he can run routes rather well. Yes, he has concentration drops, and he has those, uh, you know, issues a little bit. But I don't think they're up to the point where you consider him a liability. I thought he was better this year, more opposed to what we saw last year. I thought last case in point, you look at Alabama last year versus Alabama this year, and you don't see those drops that he had against uh, the Crimson Tide uh, in Austin as opposed to what he did this past season in Tuscaloosa. So he's getting better. He can fly legitly. Um, you can find ways to get him the football. You can scheme things for him open. Um, I know Miami seems to be the best place. Uh, why not, right? Just keep adding speed to that offense. Um, but even a place like the Rams would be a, an ideal fit for him because I feel like you just get him on turf. You get him in a situation where he has a two-way go in his curtains. Let's talk about the slot receivers. Number one ranked guy, Lad McConkey. He's not just quick, Emery. He's fast, too. Funny, right? Is he also gritty, Ross? Is he also <laughs> first guy in, last guy out, right? <laughs> but um, we know McConkey can fly. Uh, and it's funny because it was it was interesting to see all the media people just scratch and claw and find their way to try to find the white guy to compare him to. With my homeboy, Chris James, who does a great job on his pod, chopping it up with CJ and also with football game plan, it was like, man, Tyler Lockett is right there as a, as a comp. I was like, that's so perfect. That's exactly what he is. Every game we watch Lockett play, and it's a 30-yard deep overall that he's wide open. You can see that for Lab McConkie, and I'm glad people start to respect him as a receiver because he can catch. He's explosive. He knows how to stack and track, which is I'm a, I'm a big fan of. So you can even make a case for him being a, a Z if you want to. So I think he has some flexibility or versatility to play both. I love it. Uh, man, I know this much. They could not cover him. I don't know what he's doing, but it, whatever he's doing, it's it's working. Your next slot guy, Malachi Corley, is probably as well-known of a guy as you get from, from like a group of five school. Yeah, and there were some teams that wanted to see him work out as running back uh, because he was built like one. He is built like one. He's a fantastic rack guy. Um, and those guys can are worth their weight, weight and gold in the NFL because we know not everything. As much as we love the deep ball, it doesn't happen a lot in the pro game. You got to be able to win short to intermediate. You also got to be able to break tackles. Guess what Malachi Corley do? Break tackles, win short, and does a great job with the ball in his hands. So I'm a big fan of his game. Yeah, he's uh, he's an interesting prospect for sure. Some of the other slot guys you have, Emery, Jaquan Jackson from Tulane, number three. Jacob Cowing from Arizona, number four. And then Aeneas Smith from A&M. Jackson and Cowing have speed, and, and the speed doesn't even make sense. So any short pass for you, for them, and they make that one guy miss, it's over. They're gone. Um, so they're explosive and quick. That's a deadly combination, and Smith had experience as a running back, and I talked with him at the Combine about this, and he talked about how playing running back helped him as a receiver and vice versa. So in terms of yak and run or run after catch, he now is able to play over the middle of the field. He feels confident that he can play on the outside too. So I'm excited to see how his versatile game translates to the NFL. Did you talk about Smith from AM? Yeah, that's the one that has the versatile skill set that can oh, okay, play God, sorry, sorry, running sorry. back. All right, let's get to the inside receivers. And just refresh everybody's memory, difference between slot and inside in your mind. Slot is more of the twitchier guys. Inside is more of a split in that can play outside but may not have the explosiveness to consistently beat one-on-one -on -one deep down the field. So they can win. Think Marcus Colston. 
as the type of guy that would be an inside receiver? It's interesting because, uh, you know, you know a lot about the split ends and you hear a lot about the flankers, a little bit less about the slot guys. These inside guys are the guys you don't hear as much about. Um, Tejon Palmer from UAB is your number one ranked guy. He had a fantastic all-star game circuit, Ross. He probably was one of the best receivers at the Hula Bowl, got the call up to the Shrine Bowl as well and played well there. Uh, Bub Means is another one out of Pitt that I just thought was a very physical guy and you know can subtly get deeper down the field, so he gives you a little bit more of that intermediate to deep capability. Very physical, very tough player. Uh, Vele from Utah, I know he's an older prospect, but he's another one that banged inside rather well in terms of his blocking. Hayden Hatton had a great, great Hula Bowl out of Idaho. Um, you're going to be tough if you play inside that Kibbe Dome because you have no room for error uh, out the back of the end zone. You either catch the ball in bounds or you're hitting the wall. And so <laughs> while watching him uh, do well at the Hula Bowl, had a great game, great touchdown there in the confined space. I think he's a fantastic receiver. And Johnny Wilson um, doesn't play as physical as you would think a guy at 6'6", 6'7", 240 pounds does. But, I mean, he he there's pockets of 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 elite play from him. You just hope he can extrapolate that over the course of a game uh, and, and really reach his potential as a pro. Why would, why would he not like move the tight end? Like that just seems like such a no brainer that he'll, he'll move the tight end in the NFL. Um, it's the physical part, man. It's like, can he block consistently? Do you trust him to, to, you know, to play that physical game? on a down and down out basis, not in line, but what you need to do to be a tight end, you got to be able to win some of those battles. And I just need to see a little bit more physicality from him. Who are some of your sleepers at receiver Emery? Ross, I couldn't wait to get to this part because these are the guys that end up making the team, making us look smart on this show. Kyle Sheets of Slippery Rock, my guy Owen Reese, who uh, is one of the scouts for the Shrine game, was sitting next to me at the College Gridiron Showcase. And I was joking with him, and it became the running joke all week uh, with the two days of practice there. Like, hey, Kyle Sheets, my wide receiver one, because the dude was always open. He was a big-time uh, target for Slippery Rock. We know they don't have a mascot. Um, he's 6'2", 222. He can stack and track. Well, I was watching one game. Um, it was his first game back from injury. I think it was against Millersville. First play, bombing out deep. There he is underneath the underneath the rainbow touchdown pass and he has the ability to really accelerate i think he's a sleeper i'm excited to see what he runs i think he runs four or five uh he plays like that as well john giles was his college ground showcase made it look so easy he is explosive he's six two two oh eight got a call up a late call up to the hula bowl and played exceptionally well there so he's a, he's gonna be my uh Colton Powell this year, who I was a big fan of out of UT Martin that nobody would talk about, and ends up getting drafted in the seventh round by the Tennessee Titans. Keep an eye out for John Giles of West Florida. Shout out to the Argonauts. D'Angelo Hardy, we spoke about him before. North Central, Illinois, Division Three prospect. Game is very similar to Andre Reed. He is explosive. Ooh. He is a fantastic rack guy, can win over the middle of the field, can win deep down the field. He can return kicks. No one is talking about this Division Three receiver out of North Central, but Hardy is in an elite-type talent. And De David White, another star at the Hula Bowl, starred at the Shrine Bowl. He's physically well-built. You watch him on film at Western Carolina. He's always open. They get a lot of action, but we saw him go to the Hula Bowl and just bake defensive backs all week long, call up to the Shrine game, did exceptionally well there, showcasing the explosiveness, the acceleration, and the physical nature. He's more... Uh, he reminds me a lot of a slimmer, but still cut up muscle wise, not one to one, but Terrell Owens in terms of how physically imposing he looks. He's a well put together athlete, maybe slightly bigger muscle wise than Chad Johnson, and Chad Ochocinco. But David White had himself a fantastic January. Five more episodes, believe it or not, until the draft. Hard to believe. As a reminder, you can always go back. And listen or watch youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Any of our prior episodes as we break down every position. We did QB1s, QB2s. Uh, we had two episodes for the quarterbacks. We did running backs. Last week, today, wide receivers. Next week, tight ends and fullbacks. Then we'll get to the O-line, the D-line, the linebackers, the DBs. 
Tell everybody you know, this is the show. If you want to make sure you know the best rankings around, at FBall Game Plan on Twitter, go ahead and get yourself that draft guide. I promise you, you'll be happy you did so. Footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. The keg is kicked. We are all tapped out. Thanks for tuning in to College Draft. Make sure to also check out the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Even Money, and Fantasy Feast, all on the DraftKings Network, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. 